Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Come on, put those hands together and give God a praise. I know it's early. If you're watching this worship at 6 a.m., but come on, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. And if you're alive and you know he lives in you, come on and give God a praise. Come on and bless the Lord. Come on and shabbat the Lord. Come on and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. This is the day that the Lord has made, and let us rejoice. Come on, let us rejoice. Come on, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. We bless and praise God for this opportunity to worship. This is Resurrection Sunday. The Lord is risen. He's alive. The Lord is risen indeed. And how we give God thanks and praise. Our opening hymn for this Resurrection Sunday morning is number 176 if you have your Amesian hymnal. But if not, the words will be displayed on the screen. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Let us sing to the glory of God this marvelous hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today.
Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Creator God, holy God, and loving God, we come before you in your presence, thankful for the privilege to stand here on this Sunday morning to declare your glory, your power, and your might. Thankful, God, that though this world of devils feel should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for your power still reigns and you are still God and Lord. And so, oh God, we come now asking for that same power to be made evident and manifested through this preached word, that those who hear it, God, might receive it with joy. Whatever issues may plague their minds and spirits, God, I pray that you will allow your spirit to speak to every issue, to speak to every need, to speak to every concern. Thank you for what you shall speak, and thank you for what you shall say. Stand in my body, think with my mind, speak with my tongue, and I'll be careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture text for this Sunday morning comes from the Gospel according to John. John's Gospel, chapter number 20. I thank the music ministry, the media ministry, our health ministry, and all who come together to make this worship what it is to the glory of God. John chapter 20. I want to read this passage to you from the voice translation. John chapter 20, using the voice translation. Hear these words. <clears throat> Before the sun had risen on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene made a trip to the tomb where his body was laid to rest. In the darkness, she discovered that the covering had been rolled away. She darted out of the garden to find Simon Peter and the dearly loved disciple to deliver the startling news. They have taken the body of our Lord, and we cannot find him. Together they all departed for the tomb to see for themselves. They began to run, and Peter could not keep up. The beloved disciple arrived first, but did not go in. There was no corpse in the tomb, only the linens and cloths he was wrapped in. When Simon Peter finally arrived, he went to the tomb and observed the same. The cloth that covered his face appeared to have been folded carefully and placed not with the linen clothes, but to the side. After Peter pointed this out, the other disciple who had long arrived before Peter also entered the tomb, and based on what he saw, faith began to well up inside him. Before this moment, none of them understood the scriptures and why he must be raised from the dead. Then they all went to their homes. Mary, however, stood outside the tomb sobbing, crying and kneeling at its entrance. As she cried, two heavenly messengers appeared before her, sitting where Jesus' head and feet had been laid. The heavenly messenger said to her, Dear woman, why are you weeping? She answered, They have taken away my Lord, and I cannot find him. After uttering these words, she turned around to see Jesus standing before her, but she did not recognize him. Dear woman, why are you sobbing? Who is it you are looking for? She still had no idea who it was before her. Thinking he was the gardener, she muttered, Sir, if you are the one who carried him away, then tell me where he is, and I will retrieve him. Jesus said to her, Mary. 
She turned to Jesus, speaking in Hebrew, Rabboni, my teacher. Jesus says, Mary, you cannot hold me. I must rise above this world to be with my father, who is also your father, my God, who is also your God. Go tell this to all my brothers. Mary Magdalene obeyed and went directly to his disciples. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How do we wade through this narrative and use a different lens as I wade through it? And in light of what we have faced and seen, I want to talk from this thought, from insurrection to resurrection. From insurrection to resurrection. For me, for us, for many, for millions, terror and fury has a face. It was January 6th that many of us watched on Epiphany, the day of Epiphany of all days, and several thousand gathered in front of the White House under the influence of another cruel charismatic president. He deceived the crowd by saying their sacred rights had been taken away, that the so-called enemy wants to indoctrinate their children, that if they did not act, this so-called enemy would illegally and illegitimately take over this country. He loaded the crowd, aimed them at the Capitol, and gave the command. Elias Benetti has a book entitled Crowds and Power. He does this psychological study on mob violence, and he says that when one gives a death-laden command to a crowd, the anxiety of the command increases in him until it results in chaotic catastrophe. But before catastrophe overtakes him, it will have engulfed so many others. There's a lot the cameras don't capture about the survivors. Nightmares, nausea, pacing, motionlessness, inability to focus, exhaustion, insomnia, an unrelenting premonition of danger and chaos. In other words, those persons on that fateful day, January 6, 2021, Epiphany Day, the day of Epiphany, they face trauma. Today is April 4th. And Easter this year falls on April 4th, which is the anniversary of the death of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I stand in this pulpit this morning because if he had lived and kept his commitment, he was scheduled to be in the newly erected sanctuary of the Trinity Amy Zion Church, where he had come or was planning to come to speak to those who would gather in this place to galvanize them for their continued work in the struggle for freedom and justice. But before he could get here, he canceled because he wanted to stay in Memphis, Tennessee to continue marching with black men who were determined not to be treated as boys but to stand with determination, declare, I am a man. In 2021, the second Easter of the coronavirus pandemic, we celebrate resurrection in the shadow of an insurrection. Trauma is 
historians and scientists will parse out insurrection and its meaning for January 6th, and they will use words like rebellion, riot, coup, cool, for years to come. If you're like me, brothers and sisters, it's difficult to watch now the sitting president of the United States without remembering and rehearsing the trauma that we have gone through for four years under a president and government that ran rogue and engaged in wretched, ratchet politics with the sanctioning of, yes, evangelicals who parade around their religiosity in the name of their Jesus, which is not the same as my Jesus. That trauma still grips us, if you're honest with me. That trauma still grips us all, if you're honest with me. We're still dealing with what we have gone through. Oh, but brothers and sisters, this trauma is not new to people who have been kissed by nature's son. Because we have undergone 400 years of racial trauma. Racial trauma, according to the Huffington Post's recent article, comprises the mental and physical effects and consequences that black and indigenous people of color experience after being exposed to racism. Not only does it occur when a person directly experiences racism, it is also a vicarious phenomenon that can be passed through generations. Miriam Jernigan Noyce, a psychologist who studied at Boston University or Boston College's Institute for the Study and Promotion of Race and Culture, writes, this piece about racial trauma that is really unique and is really unique is the intergenerational impact. She says, so it's not just me and my lifetime and what I've experienced, it's the stories you heard from family members. It's witnessing that of colleagues or peers. And now with social media and online mechanisms of folks sharing videos, it's also witnessing things that you may not experience directly. As these issues related to race and equality continue to spark self-reflection among non-black people, the phrase racial trauma is being invoked more frequently and becoming an even more necessary official treatment area in the mental health field. Stay with me, y'all. In order for black people to address their experiences and ultimately work toward healing, racial trauma needs to be acknowledged and implemented into mental health treatment training because as the experts we spoke to emphasize, racial trauma has its own set of challenges and effects for victims. Racial trauma can create irregular sleep patterns. It can result in the over or under consumption of food. It, it, it's, it's triggered through vicarious experiences. Yeah, racial trauma causes an increase in the stress hormone cortisol. It, it generates increased symptoms related to anxiety, depression, and hypervigilance. Racial trauma will cause the human body to register racist encounters as experiences of toxic stress. Racial trauma shapes you even before you born. Mitchell, why you keep bringing all this up on Easter Sunday morning? Because my brothers and sisters, on this Easter Sunday morning, if we don't begin to deal with mental health and the trauma that people have undergone, we will never heal inwardly and we will never heal as a community. And I want to serve notice this morning to those who try to over-spiritualize 
this situation and these situations. I need you to remember that if you read this biblical narrative or right from Genesis to Revelation, when you read this biblical record, what you will discover is that there are many people, if not all persons throughout this Bible that have had to deal with trauma, had to deal with being talked about, had to deal with being mistreated and maltreated, and when the church skirts around it and says, we're trying to be spiritual, and nobody deals with the real issue of abuse and trauma, we do damage to people who really need to hear that God is a heart fixer and a mind regulator. This Bible is clear that resurrection and insurrection are met in this text. With slow measured steps, we walk with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and the beloved disciples as they investigate the tomb on Easter morning. We meet them with sober optimism, for we, like them, really wouldn't know what to expect when we arrive at this arresting site on Sunday morning. But God orchestrates these events because God works even when we don't know God is working. We often expect the Lord to work in a certain way, move in a manner familiar to us, yet there are times where God is flowing in a different direction. Notice their behavior. Grave, solemn were their faces as they drew closer to view this unusual occurrence. Now, keep in mind, beloved, they've already saw a whole lot on Friday. And they're locked into the trauma of what they've seen, not just on Friday, but on Thursday evening. And they've been locked and gripped by trauma and fear and terror. Peter and the unnamed disciple move in to observe linen clothes and they see no corpse. They saw gray clothes. They saw linen that wrapped the body of their leader. But their leader, the Lord Christ, is not there. Head napkins folded neatly apart from the other wrappings and the two disciples had to retreat. One allegedly believes but they both go home because they've been arrested by trauma. See them as they journey home with minds baffled, looking at each other as they, as they who ran to the tomb now walk away in wonder and amazement, caught up in trauma. Noticing, no, not noticing, that their female companion, Mary Magdalene, was still at the tomb weeping. It's going to get better after a while. The amazement is intensified by the tears of this faithful attendant as she stands there with only one thought to fathom. They killed him, but now they've taken his body. And we don't know where they have laid him. She's gripped, y'all, by trauma. She's gripped by terror. She's gripped by fear. Who am I talking to on this Easter Sunday morning? She has witnessed an insurrection. She has witnessed a public lynching. She has witnessed an execution. And now the body has been snatched. Terror. Trauma. On top of terror. And trauma. Help me put it, God. Terror. Trauma. Anxiety, frustration, and beloved, I hear people say, I can't wait to get back to church. I want to get back to church. Be careful what you ask for because a year has passed. I'm trying to help somebody as I pass along. A year has passed, and the same folk who walked out of this church a year ago, those same people, those people will not be the same when they walk back in this sanctuary. Be careful how we talk about, I can't wait to get back in church. All of us have had our share of trauma and we got to deal with it and not stay around it. Draw closer with me as 
I share with you how these encounters come. What happens through this experience with Mary? And I'm glad John focuses, beloved, on Mary Magdalene. Uh, because Mary Magdalene has had her share of trauma, having to live in a culture and climate where she's not even regarded as a person. And adding to that misery, the fact that she had her own abuses that led her to certain places, led her to certain spaces until the Lord met her and chased the demons away. But she still deals with the anxiety and frustration of what she's gone through. So notice, as I move close in this narrative, notice Insurrection moves to resurrection, but first there must be uh, an encounter that's found in conflict. Now, there are three types of conflict we were taught in school. Humanity against humanity, humanity against nature, and humanity against themselves. Mary reflects the third conflict. Really, really, she reflects the first and third. She, she's had conflict with other human beings, other male human beings who did not regard her, others who overlooked her, others who stigmatized her, others who stereotyped her. Yes, she's had a lot to contend with. And watch it, beloved. She's had to deal with these issues within her own being. She stands bewildered. She stands having lost the very thing that kept her from going crazy. And now she has to deal with layered conflict. Y'all better help me preach. She had been given new life and she was walking with Jesus. She had new purpose and new power. This Mary saw Jesus heal the sick and raise the dead. And she could not fathom how the same faith that he delivered Lazarus from now befalls him. She experienced the conflict that many, even on this glorious Sunday morning, while we should be happy, many of us are sad, depressed, arrested by grief. Catch the scene, y'all, because she has conflict not only outward conflict, but inner conflict. Trauma has a way of moving in and snatching up and snatching away the very thing that you know tightly to and the people you thought would never leave. So often, our conflicts leave us weak so that we can't praise. So desperate we can't wave our hands. So appalled we can't fellowship with our neighbors. So bitter that we can't see the beauty of the rainbow. So mean that we can't smile. So distraught that our moods vacillate in minutes. Up, down, up, down, up, down. So negative that we can't see God move even in the midst of conflict. But God sends this narrative to us to remind us that God, help me say it right, is still at work. Uh, I've watched with horror and anger and gotten close to a place of rage where I almost threw something at the television when I saw what was being done to George Floyd watching the miscarriage of judgment and the maltreatment of a man made in God's image. And that trauma rose up in me. The trauma rose up in many of us who have had to live through acts of police brutality. Mary has a lot to deal with on Easter. But Mary's not the only one that has a lot to deal with. You and I. Oh yeah, you're singing, but the song is stale. You, you praise it, but the praise has no power. You, you have worship, but it's weak. Yes, even though we may sit around and watch the worship service, many of us are watching it while trying to chase away the demons that 
flies into our head and psyche. And God says on this Easter Sunday morning, you are a candidate for me to step in because you need a resurrection. I wonder, like you wonder, as we look at the violence all around us, as we look at people moving aimlessly and senselessly without regard for human life, when we watch a Georgia legislator with a misguided governor in submission to whatever authority he's submitting to, roll out legislation that peels back layers of justice movement when those who worked and fought and labored died for the right to vote. And watch it, beloved, they're now being taken advantage of. Someone wants to know, has someone taken away our Lord? I confess this morning, there are times when I, when I wonder, has someone taken God away from the church? I read a recent study this past week that says only 47% of the American population practices their faith, Christian faith. We boast about being a Christian nation and less than 50% of this nation even practices religion. And most of the 47% is not faithful because of their own struggle. That we're seeing a widening gap when it comes to those who are not who are not Christian and those who do not attend church. And studies have shown before it's over with, while we have sent forth over to other lands and countries to evangelize them. This we are coming now to a place where America has become the new mission field. And one day we will see missionaries from Africa coming to America to evangelize us. Taken away our Lord, dressed him up in false garments, dressed him up as the poster child for white supremacy, dressed him up as the poster child for misogyny, dressed him up as a, as a card carrying member of the NRA, dressed him up as a card carrying member of the Republican Party, dressed him up. Where is our Mary asked, where's the Lord? They've taken him away. And we don't know where he is. But then the text also shows us that this encounter not only is found in conflict, but it's formed by confrontation. When was the last time you really had a confrontation with God? I don't mean when the last time you came to Trinity, when the last time you got your shout on, when the last time you got your dance in, but when was the last time you had a real confrontation with God? When God just flat out got in your face. Sometimes our flesh gets in the way. Our pride makes us bigger than God. Our egos make us larger than life. Our arrogance hides the sin in our lives. But every now and then, when you have really been in God's presence, now not, not, just, not just having an event, but having an encounter. When you have that encounter, something happens. Jesus shows up because Jesus recognizes that this kind of trauma cannot be handled by a substitute preacher. Mitchell. This kind of situation and trauma cannot be handled by those who try to take advantage of other people. This kind of trauma cannot be handled by legislative acts. This kind of trauma cannot be handled by dialogues and dinners. This kind of trauma cannot be handled by political and op-ed statements. This kind of trauma cannot be handled by folks showholding on Facebook. But when you really need God to speak to your issue, God doesn't send a substitute. God will show up himself. 
I said I wasn't going to do this this early in the morning, but there's somebody who ought to testify that yes, Mary is not the only one that can testify that she had to have an encounter. There's somebody else under the sound of my voice. I don't know who it is, but I just need two or three people. I'll make four who can testify that between last Easter and this Easter, I've had some doubts, I've had some fear, I've had some panic, I've had frustrations, I've had anxiety, and when I needed somebody to come to my rescue, when nobody else could help, when substance could not help, when alcohol couldn't help, when weed couldn't help, when nothing else could help, God sent Jesus right where I was, and Jesus met me. to remember something beloved and that is before there can be true resurrection there must be first some confrontation God I wish I could just step into a time capsule and view what Mary saw because her eyes are filled with tears her heart is filled with grief she couldn't fathom in her mind that somebody would take the Lord away Angels were sitting where Jesus lay, and she couldn't see the angels, and Jesus showed up, and her grief clouded his glory. Her pain covered his presence. Her desperation obstructed her deliverance. Her burden delayed her blessing. She felt defeat when she could have felt delight, because yes, she did not see a living Christ in the midst of a dead situation. And she was worshiping what was in her head. Because when you've been traumatized, talk down, you'll start worshiping the very thing that holds you captive. Ah, when you've been traumatized, you'll find yourself forgiving the very people. Yeah, forgiving them and also giving them a pass. You'll start looking at folk and say, oh, well, that's not that bad. She's not that bad. He's not that bad. It's not that bad. Not only that, you'll start turning on people you should be turning to to work together hand in hand to bring about wholeness and healing. Mary needed a confrontation, but Mary is not the only one that needs a confrontation. You and I need a confrontation. And Easter, yes, Easter is God's opportunity to show us that in the midst of the insurrections we've been witnessing through our lifetime and, and through the trauma we've had to deal with in our lifetime, Easter reminds us, resurrection reminds us that God will confront not only the enemy that brings about evil, but yes, he will confront the very things that we've been worshiping. Come on, I'm trying to go to the next point, but somebody keeps pushing me to say this to somebody in this place, somebody watching me on virtual space. God told me to tell you, quit worshiping the things that have hurt you. Quit worshiping the people that have hurt you. Quit worshiping the situations that have brought you down. Yes, I know it hurts. Yes, I know it's painful. Yes, you ought to feel what you're feeling, but don't sit there commiserating and worshiping the very things that have kept you in bondage. God sent me on assignment to tell somebody that the comforter has come. The Savior has come. And he's not coming to pat you on the back. He's coming to confront you because he knows there's more in you than what you've been through. There's more in you than what you dealt with, preach me to. There's more to you than the sickness you've had to go through. There's more to you. There's more inside of you. The Bible says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Listen, confrontation is now formed and felt by consolation. Watch, watch, watch. Mary gets it out. But then Jesus says, since I can't get you to see, maybe I can get you to hear. And he calls her, preach Mitchell, by her name. Have you ever had God call you by your name? Talk Holy Ghost. Not 
the name that people give you, not the condition people name you by, not the situation people tag onto your life, not the existential labels that people put you in and put on you. Ah, but when he calls you by your name, something wells up in you. Mary couldn't recognize Jesus with her eyes. But somewhere I read in John 10, where it says, my sheep hear my voice. And so when she couldn't see him, she could hear him. And she calls him, he calls her by her name. And when he calls her by her name, something wells up in her. And she then sees and recognizes that it's Jesus. But notice y'all, notice y'all, when she sees who it is, and she reaches for him, Jesus said, uh-uh, 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 no. That's not what you need right now. Because after you go through trouble, and Jesus speaks to you, it's not time for you to speak to somebody else. Uh-uh. Your assignment, Mary, has changed. I'm talking to some sisters in here who've been relegated to the positions of marginalization and you think that you don't have any purpose in this life. God sent me on assignment to tell you that the brown-skinned Mediterranean Palestinian Jew from the ghetto called Galilee has called your name. And this is not the season for you to be sitting around clinging to those things and clinging to people that you think can bring you relief. In other words, Mary, your position has changed. Your assignment has changed. Don't handle me as if you're the only one who knows me. I need you to go back into a context where people look at you crazy and call you crazy, but you have the temerity and the audacity to stand up and say, call me what you want to call me, but I've been seen by Jesus, and I got a message from the Lord, and the Lord told me to tell you that he is alive, and behold, he goes before you into Galilee. I wish I had one or two folks as I finish this little sermon to let somebody know, yes, we've seen some insurrections, and yes, we've seen some situations, and yes, we've been traumatized, and yes, we've been terrorized, but God has taken our trauma and has turned our trauma into triumph. God has turned our insurrection into a resurrection. And if you can hear my voice on this Sunday morning, you ought to help me give God praise because God has brought you safely through. God has brought you through dangerous toil and snares. And yes, you have some wounds. And yes, you have some bruises. But don't let the bruises outweigh your blessing. As a matter of fact, thank you, Robert Schumer. Turn your scars into stars and your hurts into halos. And don't let the troubles of this world and the troubles you've gone through cause you to forget that the same God that brought you before COVID is the same God that will bring you through COVID, the same God that brought us through border suppression and gerrymandering will bring us safely through. And if you believe that, give God a praise right where you are. I close with this. I close with this. I was, I, was, I was going to visit a member of this church who now sleeps with Jesus. I went to visit her. She was, she was in the last stages of cancer. I had not seen her in quite some time. I decided I would go to visit her one Sunday afternoon. The Lord laid on my heart to go and visit her. And when I went to visit her, we sat out and we talked. There was a puzzle on the table, and she was putting that puzzle together. She was almost done with it, putting that puzzle together. And she was sitting there. Her family had gone in another room. She said, I want to talk to you alone. I began to talk to her, and we talked about her news. I told her how sorry I was to hear that the cancer 
was ravaging her body. She looked at me and said, you think this something? I've been through worse than this. I've had trauma the likes of which you have never seen and I pray you never see it. I've had to endure hurts and pain that has been so excruciating I wonder whether or not God really loved me. She talked about her life and talked about her journey and talked about the times she had to stand firm and stand anchor, not knowing how she would be able to take care of her children. But God somehow made a way out of nowhere. God somehow opened doors. God somehow gave her the courage to finish school and take care of her children. And she looked at me and said, you know what? You think this cancer is bad, but this cancer ain't got nothing on the hell I've been through. I know this cancer may, may, may think it has the last word, but this cancer doesn't have the last word. Yes, I've gone through my share of ups and downs. I've gone through my share of pain and trauma. I've gone through my share of abuse, but I outlived it all. And although this cancer may be doing a job on my body, my soul is still anchored. And I have a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by every foe. And I started looking at her, and my mind began to roll back to this text because, yes, there are people who've gone through trauma. You'll never know what they've gone through because they look like a picture of hell. But there's one or two of you in here that don't mind testifying had some trauma in your life, but I want to thank God for that sister who now sleeps with Jesus. I ain't going to tell you her name, so don't even ask me what her name is, but I thank God for her to this day, because what she taught me on that Sunday afternoon is that you don't let your pain and your trauma and your terror define your conduct. You don't let what you go through define your behavior, that somehow or another, you get the strength you need. That though the tears may fall, though the storms may rage, though the billows may roll, you learn how to roll up your sleeves and square your shoulders and stand firm and be reminded that the God who brought you thus far has promised never to leave you. God, I feel this thing. I gotta let you know, but come on. I need one or two folk who don't mind saying yes. I've had my share of trauma, but I heard God remind me in the wee wee hours of the midnight that he will never leave me nor forsake me. Yes, I've had to walk the garden by myself, but come here Elijah Hewitt, I come to the garden alone where the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses and Don't you give up? Still 
alone. We've been through much. We've been through much. Oh, but God still has his hands on you. You've been through some hell and high water. But he kept you from sin. He kept you from drowning. He kept you from falling under. Now unto him who is able to keep you. And he is a keeper. You are not alone. God's with you. And he promises never to leave you. Nor forsake you. In the name of the Father. And of the Son. And of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My brothers and sisters. On this Easter Sunday. Give them strength 
I pray that you will encourage them right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you for healing them. I thank you for touching them. I thank you for speaking to them right where they are. Oh God, may they experience a newness of life. And when they leave from wherever they are, and when this worship is ended, they will see a door open where they see their futures bright, where they can experience a brightness and a freshness that comes because of our relationship with you. Touch God as only you can. Heal as only you can. And we give you honor, glory, and praise. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. If you need somebody to talk to, you can call us. We also refer. So if you want someone to talk to, Trinity, I'm of the opinion now. I'm not ashamed to tell folks there's nothing wrong with going to a therapist. Nothing wrong with going to someone to talk your issues out. Do it. I stand as one who really believes that spiritual, emotional, and mental health I believe that you can get the help you need. You may not be able to get over it, but I thank God that he'll give you grace to go through. Somebody ought to thank God for that. He will give you grace and power to go through it. May God bless you. May God keep you. I love you. God loves you. And until we gather in space again together, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Ghost, rest, rule, and abide with you now, henceforth, and forever. And the people of God said, Yourselves. Be safe out there. See you next week. Peace and blessings.